Good morning. Welcome to worship here at First Congregational Church. If you're joining us for the first time, there's a lot of interesting and odd characters out there uh, for this holiday weekend, but we like to have a lot of fun here at FCC. This is the Halloween weekend before. Um, it is also the day after Gail's 106th birthday. Um, Gail is at home. She wishes she could be here last week, and this week she's having a little bit of uh, stability issues, but Gail is so thankful to be uh, remembered and lifted up in prayer and showing our love. As we get ready for uh, the holidays really to, beginning, uh, to begin here next couple months, uh, this Friday coming up, um, Amity is leading a, a dinner called All Souls Remembrance or a Dumb Dinner, um, the old English um, version, not stupid, but dumb that um, those who cannot speak is what she means. But that'll be um, this Friday at 6 o'clock, uh, moving from dessert first, yes, if nothing else, come for dessert first, and moving your way back to the appetizer or salad. Um, so if you're interested, there is a sign-up on the uh, Friday Flash, and if you're not part of that, we can get you signed up for that, um, or just talk to me after service, and I'll sign you up for the All Souls Remembrance. It's a time for us to... Um, through the Christian perspective, remember those who have passed on before us. So you're invited at our All Souls Remembrance to bring items from a loved one um, who has passed on before us that we can uh, remember them and hold them in that sacred liminal space. Next Sunday is All Saints Sunday as we remember those in our congregation and our lives who have passed away in the last year. So um, as an invite, invitation, not only will we be honoring those who have passed away, but I invite you to um, come with your memory and legacy of those who have passed on in years past. Um, you'll have an opportunity to light a candle in a, as a sign of remembrance um, for them at that time. So next Sunday, All Saints Sunday. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Michigan Conference of the United Church of Christ. Um, Abby, Lisa, Cheryl, Lana, and I were there um, in Grand Rapids, we made it there and back, and we still wanted to be here with all of you um, to celebrate the wonderful time we had. Um, I bring greetings from also Reverend Case Van Kempen and Reverend David Wheeler, who are also there, and Reverend Jody Benton, so it's like a family reunion, right? So they all bring their greetings to you as well. It was a very timely meeting as we were talking about um, some of the issues that many churches are facing right now with finances and, and figuring out our mission after a uh, time of COVID. And so Cheryl actually got to um, have her book that we've been using for Back to the Future meetings and uh, gave a major shout out to that. And the speaker was talking exactly about that. So what we are talking about in this church is very relevant to what many churches are talking about in the United Church of Christ and across Christianity. Next week, we uh, on Thursday, or excuse me, on Saturday, we honor the life of Carolyn um, Lynn, who Lafrand, who is celebrating uh, her life and legacy. Uh, Nancy Hirsch and her family will be celebrating here in the sanctuary next Saturday. So um, you're invited to pay your respects if you would like to, um, and come for that. And then the following Saturday, on the 11th. We have our fall cleanup. I know what you've been all waiting for, to get your leaf blowers ready and to get your rakes ready. Well, now is that time, November 11th. So come for that and to work on the church float as well. So I invite you at this time to rise in spirit and body and greet each other in the sign of Christian love. Are you good? Okay. Stand right here. Stand right here. Morning. Will you... Um, Stand up, back up, and join me in the call to worship, <laughs> which is printed in your bulletins. Loving God, you care for the world, day in and day out. Open our hearts that we may care with you. Compassionate God, you heal the world, day in and day out. Open our eyes that we may heal and care with you. Merciful God, you forgive the world, calling us back to you day in and day out. Open our minds that we may forgive ourselves and each other. You made us in your image, caring, compassionate, forgiving. Let us become who we are, walking with you day in and day out. Beloved, come. Let us worship God. Let us worship God. And our opening prayer, 
Righteous God, your law is love. Your message is love. Your presence is love. May love fill our atmosphere and our interactions as we gather together in your name. May love transform us, renew us, and revive us. Amen. Please be seated. So one of the things as pastor that I am reminded to myself and remind to you that I'm open to feedback. So I know there's things that have changed, especially since uh, before COVID and calling new pastors and interim pastors. So if there's anything that you'd like to see in worship, please let me know. Or maybe an older tradition that we want to bring back. So we have our noisy offering, which we're going to do later on the surface. We brought that back. Uh, Lillian reminded us, uh, Reverend, Lillian, Reverend Dr. Lillian Daniel, our Michigan Conference uh, minister, reminded us of an introduction to scripture, which I know we did before with previous pastors. So what's old is new again, and I'm bringing that back as a summary for what we're talking about. Great. You're welcome. I like that. Yep. So our scripture today reminds us of, of two things. So our first from Exodus is... That defying orders of someone who has power over you can be both scary and risky to put yourself out there, but to remind yourself that God is with you. God has always been about helping out those who are hurting, those who are struggling, those who are feeling lonely. God is hardly ever found in this comfortable, quiet place, besides in prayer, but God is with those who are challenging authority for others' sake. God is with those who are hurting. So here we find in Exodus two women who defy Pharaoh's orders because God has spoken to them. By saying yes to God, they had to say no to Pharaoh. The two women relied on their faith in God and their decisions to witness the sacredness of birth and of life itself. And from our gospel lesson from Matthew, Matthew's Bible Matthew's verses this week are repeated in every church that I've been a part of. In my home church, they still repeat it, and often it is done with generations holding hands or looking at each other saying, this is a story that we're telling ourselves. This is not only connects us with the Christian uh, realm, the Christianity around the world, but it connects us through the generations. Young and old, rich and poor, hurting 
and those who have it figured out for the moment. Together, these powerful words about loving God with your whole self are spoken. Love God with your whole self, for God's love for us knows no limit. So from Exodus. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? And the midwives said to the Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, God gave them families. And from Matthew 22. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then? that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. <laughs> the word of the Lord. <laughs> Thanks be to God. So how do you love others? How do you love others? Yeah. Um, show them respect. Show them respect, right? What else? Family of God, that's all you. How do you love others? Hug them. Being nice. Being nice, right? Maybe sharing food, Share right? Food. Sharing your favorite snack, right? Yes. Give them money if they're poor. Give them money if Buy toys for people, or share your toys, right? Barb, yeah. Bring them to church. Bring them to church, yes. So where do you find people to love? Where do you find people to love? Ooh, that's a hard question, huh? Everywhere, right? Everywhere. Everywhere, right? So I'm going to do a uh, storytelling magic trick, if it works out. You know how some of the magic tricks don't work out, but here we go. So... This looks like a blank sheet of paper. So this is about love. So love by itself can't do much. So there's a group of people who wanted to go out and love other people, but they didn't know where to find it. So they got in a boat. They made a boat. So they got their boat here. I know it's a flat bottom boat, but use your imagination. So they got a boat so the wind can carry them away, but they didn't find anyone to love there. So then they wanted to go inside some houses and in communities where people might be hanging out. So we got our building here, and they looked everywhere. They looked upstairs, looked downstairs, but they couldn't find anyone to love. So they said, well, we need to travel some more. So they built an airplane It's hard to make an airplane, especially on your lap, right? But Pastor Scott's going to try. So they built an airplane. They could travel overseas. They could find everyone near and far, right? Let's 
They said, you know, there's things that we don't need to love people. So they built a rocket ship. <laughs> they can go to the entire universe and find people to love. You like my rocket sounds? I've been practicing. <laughs> yeah, we don't need that to love people. So you know what they found out? After all their travels, after going the entire world and the entire universe to find people to love, there's enough love right within them. Yeah, it's a cross. So the love of God, though they were searching for everybody, was within them. That Jesus calls us to love people by loving ourselves, by loving God, and loving all those people that they encountered but didn't know how to love. That's what the cross reminds us to do. So, love is just ordinary piece of paper, remind us of that. But we changed shapes, we went places, and our story defined people to love. And God loves us, and Jesus loves us. So everyone you see around here, everyone that you encounter, you can love. You can share your snack, you can cheer them up, you can be happy with them. That's what love calls us to do. So can you repeat after me as we pray? Dear God, you call us to travel. We might be uncomfortable. It might be scary. But you call us to love. To love you. To love ourselves. To love everyone we encounter. Because everyone deserves the love of being in God's family. Amen. So I've got some. Well, as many have reminded me the last two years that this is also a special Sunday besides Halloween coming up or 
the Halloween before Sunday. It's also Reformation Sunday in many churches. And so I would be a different kind of pastor if I didn't ask from the UCC, especially congregational side, who is our, who is our, uh, our champion, who is our theologian in the Reformation? Calvin, Zwingli, Luther? Zwingli, all right, you've had some good pastors in the past. Ulrich Zwingli, right? Name you always talk about with people. Ulrich Zwingli, who is Swiss. I'm not going to do this whole sermon on this, just to let you know. But Ulrich Zwingli, who is Swiss reformer, was so much invested in the Reformation, so the reform side of our church, the evangelical and reform side of the UCC primarily, but also the congregationalists, who we are. But Zwingli had a couple facts that I just wanted to let you know about who we are still as God's people from over 500 years ago, still bears repeating. So before anyone had ever heard of the name Luther, not only in Switzerland, but many parts of Europe, uh, Swingley says, I began to preach the gospel of Christ in 1516. I started preaching the gospel before I even heard Luther's name. Luther, whose name I did not know for at least another two years, had definitely not instructed me. I followed simply the Holy Spirit alone. See, Luther and Zwingli never met each other, but Luther really talked down to Zwingli. He actually hated him and called him some pretty inappropriate and vulgar things at the time, even though they had the same struggle. Both Luther and and Zwingli were both ordained priests in the Catholic Church, but wanted to reform it, not change it or destroy it. So Luther, who got married, Zwingli did it before him, even as a priest. One of the big differences between Calvin, Zwingli, and Luther, especially Luther and Zwingli, was how they feel about communion, which is so important in our churches. Where Luther thought the bread and the wine or grape juice was changed in that Christ's spirit was in the breaking of the bread and pouring of the cup. Zwingli took more of our interpretation here that it is the belief that, quote Zwingli said, believe that the church was the body of Jesus. When the church participated in the common bread and cup, it formed into Jesus' own body. Something mystical happened, but it happened to the people, not the bread. This is in that this is my body, the people of God. It was more symbolic, pointing that what happens in the church takes practice and it takes time to put our differences aside to share in a common meal of the one who called us and bears our name. So it's our rich heritage from Zwingli, and I know you're all going to go look up more about Zwingli when you get home or even on Halloween, so I just, I just want to get that started for you. So we're called to lure, love, and serve God. As Naomi wonderfully put it, it's a strange text that we hear from Exodus about why would these women who were Hebrew listen to Pharaoh and simply turn over these Hebrew women to let their children, especially their sons, be killed by Pharaoh? It seems a little ironic that this would go about. But strange times we live in, just as the Hebrew women lived in strange times as well. That these Hebrew midwives served or were forced to serve Pharaoh, to turn over their own people for the wrath of Pharaoh. When we jump ahead to Matthew's gospel about loving others the way we fully love God. To fully love ourselves and others, we need to first love God, and these two are deeply connected. This is often known as the great commandment. Now, in confirmation class, many of you and our confirmads that are in process will learn the Ten Commandments. And a lot of you of a certain age will say, well, why aren't the confirmads memorizing the Ten Commandments and repeating it before the congregation? Because as Jesus often taught his disciples that it's easier to learn one, one A and one B, as we hear the Great Commandment, than learning ten. But the Great Commandment of loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself embodies all of the Ten Commandments in one. To love God as your full self gets one through six, and then seven through ten are loving your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus just simplified it, making it easier. To love one thing, God above all else, than to love your neighbor as yourself, hangs all the law and the prophets. So we get to this point in Exodus, 
that these midwives, these Hebrew midwives, are forced into servitude as they are in exodus. They are away and in captivity by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They have no choice but to live in fear, to be away from their home community, their people, and to see that there might not be any hope, that they must do what Pharaoh says and block out and just not listen to what God says. But God, as we talked about earlier, is always, always where people are hurting or struggling or in their discomfort zone. And so God shows up. And God says, do not do this. Do not listen to Pharaoh before I am your God alone. Why would you listen to Pharaoh and kill your own people when I have made you a holy priesthood, a chosen people? Listen to me. And even the women outsmarted Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was kind of good with that. The last verses we, that I left out, because it reminds us the grim reality of our own kind by not listening to God, is that the verse uh, that is left out, it says that Pharaoh instead saved all Hebrew women or girls who are born, but whenever Hebrew boys are born, Pharaoh would take them or have his servants take them and kill the Hebrew boys. Because in this example, Pharaoh sees that the Hebrew midwives, these Hebrew women, are smart because they don't get to the point of being on the birth stool. They are in such fear of Pharaoh, what happened to their family, their children, that they give birth before they get to the point of being with the Hebrew midwives in, in this position of the birth stool. So, God has God's ways, but Pharaoh says, all right, I'll show a little mercy. I'll protect the Hebrew girls, but not the Hebrew boys, because they are a threat to me and to the Egyptians. Out of this deep hurt in the world, out of this deep misunderstanding of how human nature is, God steps into this broken community. God steps in and says, there is a better way forward, and I am there. I, the Lord your God, have made you, and I'm reclaiming you, so listen to me and not the ways of the world. Do not fear Pharaoh, but instead fear me or have respect for me instead. It takes great sacrifice and risk to say that you've heard God or you've listened to God and then to repeat it and tell others about it, right? My ministry boards, when I was going through the process, even the UCC, um, so my ministry board said, what, what has gotten into you that you are feeling called to ministry? So I said, I've had some dreams. I've had these visions, if you will, about this call to ministry. And they say, wow, that's really, that's really special. You know, I wish I had that. And I said, well, thank you for acknowledging that. I said, but wait. I said, yeah. And they said, when you go to churches or when you share your, uh, your story to ministry, don't tell anyone about you've had visions or dreams. Come again? Don't tell anyone about that. Why not? It's, it's about our faith. Well, they might think you're crazy. Oh, okay, but I mean, I think in the Bible we read about like Joseph having dreams and Mary seeing visions and, you know, encounters that cannot be explained. Well, yeah, yeah, but that's, that's in the Bible. That's not real life, right? But I didn't listen, you know. Call me young, call me stubborn. But there are real moments in our lives that God is speaking to us. Maybe not in dreams or in visions, but in the hurting of the world. In things in, that may seem like injustice, things that make, don't make sense, that break the lives and break our hearts, that we are called to speak up about, to say, no, no, no. We are called to do something different. These Hebrew women are an example of being disobedient in a good way. They weren't being violent and causing a revolution, but they're saying, God's ways are better. They choose life. They choose love. They choose a better way forward. They are honoring God by loving God with their whole selves and loving their neighbor, their own Hebrew community, more than themselves, even if it is risky and scary. So we get to this part in Matthew's gospel. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law that you shall love your neighbor, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law on the prophets. 
taking the Ten Commandments and making it one and one B. Easy to remember, harder to practice. In our wonderful Michigan Conference um, get-together, we had a wonderful presentation about where hurting happens in our world. And many churches, not just the United Church of Christ, but many churches all over the globe, but especially in America, have been caught up, have been thrown off guard as our lives have been turned upside down the last couple of years. And our conference was so very relevant because we're talking about this in our own church. We've been in 197 years of faithful ministry in Rochester. You're here, going to hear some themes in the parish post and some themes they heard this week, and so I'm going to repeat them again. That God is doing amazing things in our church and has done amazing things in our church to heal the brokenness, to heal the hurt, to find the connection, not for ourselves, but for the glory of God. And as a young pastor and young at this church, I need you to tell me the stories of this church. I need you to have your witness to show and speak about how God is changing you or changing the denomination. So in our parish post and what I've learned this week, more about the story, and we talked about it in our future meeting this last week, is we are finding ourselves, like many churches, asking, why aren't people coming to church? We've been here for 197 years. Aren't we doing amazing things? We're being the church. We're going to the park. We're doing the Halloween fest. We're doing downtown Christmas parade. Why aren't people coming on Sunday? Well, as many of you know, our lives got flipped upside down during COVID, and we feel a tremendous amount of grief. We feel a tremendous amount of sadness and exhaustion. We didn't really have proper time in our societies from bouncing to one thing to another about how our lives were rapidly changing so much in three or four years to really bear the raw emotions of ourselves in a, a positive way, not a vengeful or jealous way. And so our, our church, as we look forward into the future with our future team meetings and also our back, we're reminded that we have done amazing things in this community, that we have been an icebreaker not only as a denomination of being a church of first in the congregational and the e side, the Christian side, the African-American side, but here in Rochester, we've been doing amazing things. And I've been discovering this, and I've been trying to pull it out and tell our story together as best I can, but I need to hear from you. So let me remind you of our story real quickly. We are an icebreaker church. We have been. For people who didn't fit the mold of society, from Gail Kemmler's father, who was a Baptist who couldn't do a movie theater, which was, didn't seem scandalous at the time, but he was not allowed to be a, a, a Baptist at the time, many years ago, right? And to be, poor, be involved in performing arts. So he said, this is my career, this is my livelihood. So where can I find a church that will accept me? Even though my theology, theologies and beliefs might be different, I'm accepted for who I am. So Gail Kemmler, our oldest member, 106 years old, got her roots in our church because her father, her family, wasn't accepted. Our church stepped out in a leap of faith by having Emmer Ballard, an African-American woman who grew up in slavery, picking cotton in the South, and came up here in Rochester with her family. And in the 1880s, I believe it was, 1890s, she was accepted as a full member, full sitting member in this church. Her birthday celebration was on that table outside, one of our seven communion tables. Yes, we still have seven. But Elmer was still celebrated as a full member. Even before she got the right to vote, she was seen as a beloved child of God, and the church recognized her for all she was doing. Many years later, she would get the right to vote, be seen as a full woman and full member of, this United, this, of the United States. But before... We were just early. This church started Cliffview Apartments, which still exist, of senior housing and low-income housing. It was the first ever successful project, partnership between a church and a housing community. And it was sold at a profit for Heisinger, the endowment which we serve a community still, was part of that sale. It was with the help of other churches in the community that we started, or in partnership started, the food pantry, which is in that clothing closet, or it was in the closet downstairs. You've probably seen it at the youth room. And now it's 
completely beneath us in our space with neighborhood house. It was such a success that it was in such a need that we as a church said, here's what we started with our churches. It is our blessing to have it in a better space and give it up to neighborhood house. This has freed us to do bold and beautiful things that we still have wonderful things to do ahead of us. We've dabbled in pride in the park and pride worship, of being involved in Halloween fest, of doing Christmas baskets. There's wonderful things that we're trying to do to heal the hurting of this world and community. But in our meeting yesterday with our speaker, we talked about the topic of why aren't people coming to churches? Well, in this time that we talked about of grief and struggle, we think that we're being the church and we're starting to tiptoe out into the world. But our speaker told us yesterday that Jesus had his disciples go out with a cloak or tunic on their back and their sandals, but no food, no wine or water or nourishment, but to go be with the hurting in the world. To take your tent, this building, I know it doesn't fold up, but to take our space, this holiness, this community of God that we see each other as family in nature, and to take it out into the world. Now, when I sat there, I said, oh, yep, we, uh, we know that we had our air conditioner break down. It cost us lots of money, right? We have an old building, as many churches do, and we can't fold it up, right? And we're not calling to sell the church. But what in my head I realized, I was sitting in the front row, so Abby and Lisa were somewhere else, so they would have seen the smirk on my face. But what I thought of that I, I think is God talking to me and talking to us is that though we can't fold this church up, and I know there's powerful memories, what we can do is take this church as a launch pad. We can just take this church as a, uh, a launch pad or a catalyst and go out to find the hurting in the world. So our speaker yesterday told us, you know, how do you do this as a consultant and as an ordained minister? Well, all of you have experienced hurt. You all may have experienced grief during the COVID pandemic. Because what we talked about in our, our wonderful God is still speaking moment of our worship time was that for one person who lost their lives or is struggling with um, long COVID or how their lives have changed, there's nine people affected by that loss of the one person, affected by the loss of long COVID that is still suffering today with grief, with loneliness, with hurting, whatever shape or form it may take. And people may not come to churches on Sunday because, well, there's been almost three years off and they've either fallen in the habit or they're still much hurting their own life. So what was suggested, or and I think is very valid, is to take a bunch of different things, different methods. One was to take a clipboard and to go meet your neighbors, introduce yourselves. We're in neighborhood, right? The curse of two turns. We're off Rochester Road. But to take a clipboard or have those conversations with your neighbors and saying, put on this piece of paper or tell me, where do you hurt? Where do you have grief? Where would you like to see change in our world and in our community? And write it down or speak to me. And then as a church, as people together on this journey, we need to pull together where we hurt, where our community hurts around us, where our neighbors hurt, and be the church together and find that change and tackle some of those things. We can't do everything, but we can do some things together. We are inviting people in new ways by game night, by Halloween fest, by costumes and church, but we need to get the word out and tell our story about how we can join together. Not come join us, because we don't have it all figured out, but as God's people in this beloved community we call Rochester, together, figure out where the hurt is, and figure out how we can be loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. So, our task for at hand, right, is to talk. It's scary, I know. But it's not as scary as the task that the Hebrew women had to say no to Pharaoh, to say yes to God. Talk to each other. Tell your story. Tell how you fell in love with this church or how this church changed you and how the United Church of Christ has changed you in little ways and in big ways. Next week, I'll share my story of how this church changed my life literally forever and how the United Church of Christ has changed since I was a little kid, has continued to change my life for the better. 
And I'll share with permission a story of, by the, the Johns about how they have done wonderful things and how this church, the United Church of Christ, has changed them. But for right now, tell your story of how this church has changed you and how the United Church has changed you and where you hurt so we can come together with our families and our community together to be the church, to be bold and loving to our God and our neighbor. All these things matter because you matter. May it be so. Amen. I invite you to rise in spirit and body to sing with us a hymn that is very familiar. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing is the tune, but oh, for a world. This idea that we are changing the world by loving God as ourselves and loving our neighbor the same. Please be seated that we can come together as a family of God to lift up our joys, our sorrows, our doubts, and those we succeed at. If you have to raise your hand with a, a prayer, and our ushers will come around with the microphone. Hi, I have a great joy again. I had a, another great granddaughter that was born Friday, uh, Emery Brochu, and uh, she's gorgeous and beautiful, and we're so grateful. And, Thankful, God, it's good. And happy birthday, Gail. Prayers of Thanksgiving for Nan being a great grandmother again, and for the life of God and the people of God to come together to share celebrations. Happy birthday, Gail. Hope you're watching. Please say some prayers for those who are uh, suffering from flu, strep throat, COVID. RSV or any other ailment. Heidi's under the weather, can't make it, and she's missing our little costume. So Napoleon Bonaparte will not make an appearance today. But pray for everyone who's feeling under the weather and they miss family events or fun events or any event or important events with their family. So just pray for them and give them comfort. Pray for all those who are healing for the many things that are going around right now. We ask for prayers for Heidi with her healing. Heidi, when you get better, we expect to see a picture of your costume, but not until you're better. Prayers for healing for Phyllis and prayers for peace in Europe, in the Middle East, and in the world. We ask for prayers for Phyllis that she may be in less pain and she can be uh, attended by our prayers and that we continue to lift up peace in our communities across this nation, across the world, that war and violence may be learned no more. Um, I have two. Um, prayer of joy from yesterday, um, our largest Michigan conference gathering at 151 people, um, gathered from over 65 different 
UCC churches in Michigan, which was just unbelievable. It was a really inspiring time. Um, you can watch it online on YouTube. It's up. Um, but also a prayer concern um, for Kim Newport, for those that know her. Um, it's technically a broken back. She will have to have surgery. Just prayers for her healing and for her uh, mental health during this time. We left out both the great joy of being together in person for our Michigan Conference uh, meeting to have those connections uh, made with new colleagues and fellow colleagues for just the joy that is a relevant celebration. And we hold Reverend Kim Newport in prayer and healing um, with upcoming uh, mercies on our health and healing. So we hold both great joy and connection with Michigan conferences and the ministers that are part of it. Prayers of thanksgiving for our son-in-law, Joe. He had a PET scan this week, and there are no active cancer cells. Oh, my gosh. Okay. And Praise God. And Don is doing well with his pacemaker. Okay. Praise God for Joe had a uh, PET scan done, and there's no active uh, tumors. Uh, Joe had done uh, six treatments of chemotherapy, so prayers and healing upon Joe and your family, and continued prayers for Don after receiving a pacemaker. Prayers for my rel relatives of mine, Francis and Francine, who lost their husband, father, Pete, um, and he passed away. And I would also like to say that this is the time of year where a lot of people start experiencing seasonal depression, especially with the time change. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not seasonal, I want to pray for everyone who's having mental health issues and also economic issues. We pray for all those who are hurting, who are mourning the loss of someone uh, in recent times. For those who are experiencing seasonal depression, as we talk about honoring all saints or Day of the Dead, or Toten Fest in the next week to come. For those who are experiencing loss or are reliving those memories of those who are without, who have gone before us to be with God, please hold them in prayer at this time. I want to thank you for lifting up prayers for my friend Jim Clinton, who yesterday uh, buried his younger brother, who is believed to have a heart attack, um, so it's always hard to, for any parent to bury a child, but also for brothers to bury the youngest in their family way before his time. So prayers of thanksgiving for the Clinton family for prayers offered. And for prayers for Gail, for a happy birthday for all who sent her cards or her visited her this week. Um, there is still time to uh, send Gail a card on this wonderful time of celebration for 106 years of faithful ministry on this earth. So let's take all these things together and be with God. I will invite you to close with me with the Lord's Prayer. So let's take the time to be with God. God, you invite us and call us with the reminder of Scripture to go to find the heat hurting the loneliness, the places that break our heart in the world because it hurts you as well. You embolden us through our faith, through each other, through your church to be the church, to own up and practice the faith that you have taught us. You call us to be disciples, to take what we have, to leave the comforts of our tent our church, and to go outside the walls and to be your community where there is risk, when there is hurting, there is real life happening. God, you've called us to be disciples, to be so in love with you, with our whole selves, that we love our neighbor as ourselves. That as we fall more in love with you, that we become more like you and less like our own selves. That when people see us, they say, you're a follower of Jesus. And simply call us as that, not by our own name. 
God, we know that there is much hurting. There is much violence still in our own communities, in our nation. Yet there is still hurting across for neighbors across the world in Russia and Ukraine. There is still hurting in Israel and in Gaza. And you call us to make a difference. You call us to not shy away, to lift up our prayer, but to do more, to heal the hurting of this world. So God, make us bold enough to claim that, that call to leave the comforts as we leave today. We've come for worship and we've been called out to serve as we depart. So God, today we lift up the celebration of Nan having another great-grandchild. Birthday prayers and celebrations for Gail, who even though can't be with us, we send your love and celebration with you, Gail. Prayers for all who are healing from sickness or are going through all that's going around. We hold you in our prayer that you may be healed and join us in your time. We ask for prayers for Phyllis, who is in pain and who wishes could be with us. We ask for healing of our own communities of brokenness and division, that all may be made new, and that God's beloved community may be made a reality in our time. We are thankful for the joy of being together, that churches can have a reunion of seeing friends that we haven't seen in person for many years, for reconnection, for wonderful conversations of renewal. God, we thank you for this Michigan conference, for our leaders, and for the way that your spirit is calling us this day. We ask for prayers for ministers in our own communities and in our denomination that are hurting. For prayers for Reverend Kim Newport for healing and recovery, that Kim may be with as minimal pain as possible and her healing may progress even faster than expected. God, we are thankful and rejoice for those who are cancer-free that you have been with them with their medical teams. So we celebrate and lift up Joe with his recent PET scan. It has no new tumors. Praise God for the healing that is done. And God, we lift up those who mourn this day for recent loss of life, that their memories, their pain, the love that they shared is not in front of us, but may be found all around us. God, wherever you are, they are with you too, that we can experience their presence through you. So God, as we come to next Sunday, as we celebrate All Saints Sunday, that we can lift up and share the light and light a candle for those who have gone on before us that still cause us pain for the great love that was shared. We have time to remember with reflection and dinner on Friday, and whatever moments we have this week to celebrate our cultural heritage with honoring those who have gone before us. But God, with the saints who have gone before us to teach us love and to teach us how to love you and love each other as ourselves, we lift up and share the prayer that you taught us as God's people and current active disciples in the world as we share together the Lord's Prayer as we say, Our Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we started out last week, it is our stewardship campaign that we can take all that we are, our financial gifts, our talents, our passions, our dreams, and be the church. Not only on Sunday, but on Monday through Sunday. That we can take the stories of what, where people's hearts break, take the stories of our dreams, our passions, and to be the church and make it a reality. So as part of our stewardship campaign, we focus on God who's given us first. God created human life. God has always gone to the margins for us and for the people of God so that we can make a difference that is real and lasting. So as our stewardship campaign continues, we ask that you give back a portion of what God has given you, that we can heal the brokenness of the world and we can be the church in all its beauty, 
all its doubts, all its faithfulness together. So at this time, we offer a portion of what God has given to us with our morning offering. Will you join me with our prayer of dedication? Compassionate God, who heals our wounds and lifts up our lives, bless these gifts to your healing, redemptive work, repairing the world one heart, one relationship, one ministry at a time. Thank you for the joy of participating in your compassion, your abundant life, your love for the world, in the generous, beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Before you go, if you've got a, a costume on or outfit, come to Fellowship Paul. We'd like to get a picture with you. We'll still have donuts left over, so grab your donut. If you haven't signed up for the uh, remembrance on Friday for the dinner, we'd have dessert first. Um, come talk to me or there, look back at your email. There's a sign up in there. And before you go... I invite you to come back next week as we celebrate those who have gone on before us, as we celebrate All Saints Sunday. There will be a time on either side of our chancel area that you can light a candle for remembering someone who has passed on that you still remember. Maybe you still grieve them, but you want remembered to light a candle in their memory and in their legacy. So as you go, receive this benediction. May you go out to serve. You've come to worship, but now it's time to go depart to make a difference to the community that only you know how. God goes with you with the love that you have for God, the love that you bear as a beloved child of God. Go, have courage, for God goes with you through all things. Amen.